الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ما بعد اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Inshallah, we will continue with the lesson of the seerah of the our blessed and beloved and honored Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And alhamdulillah, so far we completed the first stage of his life, and that was the Mecca stage. And we said that he spent in Mecca. How long did he spend in Mecca? How many years? Total, 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 from his birth all the way to his leaving, 53 years old, okay? So at the age of 53, we explain why he had to uh, leave Mecca, his most beloved place, the place in which he grew up, the place in which all of his forefathers, lineage, all of his ancestors were from, starting from... Ismail alayhi salam all the way to his father Abdullah and we mention all of that and then we mention his sacrifice alayhi sallallahu alayhi sallam alayhi salatu wa salam when migrating even during the migration they didn't leave him alone they hunted him and Abu Bakr Siddiq down and we said that because of that instead of taking a few days perhaps a week or eight days walk it took him all in total about 13 days because he had to head south, south sorry, and he had to hide for three days, two, three days, and then he had to take a different path, which is close to the coastal path, which is not the usual path that the, uh, the merchant would take when they would travel to Medina or from Mecca to uh, Medina or Medina to Mecca. And Alhamdulillah, we said after this hard and tough time that our Prophet Muhammad went through, after the fear that Abu Bakr had for our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we said that in Rabi' al-Awwal, in year 13 of Rabi' al-Awwal. So Prophet Sallallahu left in year 20, uh, in year 13, I mean, what I mean by year 13? Uh, year 13 of prophethood. Year 13 of prophethood when he was 53 years old in uh, Shahar Safar, around 28th of Safar, 28th of the second Islamic month, he left. And he arrived, there's a difference of opinion. The majority, they say that he arrived on the 8th or 9th of Rabi' al-Awwal. But some of the scholars, historians, they say that since he was born on the 12th, he died on the 12th, a lot of things happened on the 12th, he arrived on the 12th. But looking at the, uh, when you look at the um, records and when you look at the uh, books and the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the history, we find out that he wasn't, uh, close to the truth, the closest to the truth that he arrived in Medina on the 8th of Rabi' al-Awwal and he was on Monday and he arrived around noon, it was very hot because people when they heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi left and successfully escaped the hunting and the bounty hunters they were waiting for him every single morning from uh, Shuruq al-Shams all the way to Dhuhr as he get closer to Dhuhr it was very close very hot so people would go back home but then a man shouted out on the 8th of Rabi' al-Awwal there's a man with his companion coming walking coming through and they all yani, left the house and they were all excited to meet our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the first place he arrived was in Quba the first place because Quba is south of Medina it's about two miles three miles south of Medina so Quba is the first not the first but one of those uh, settlements if you can say that one of those uh, occupied and populated places in Medina Medina it wasn't like it is now where we have the town city and uh, no it was like here and there it was a bit here a bit of there a bit of north a bit of west a bit of east and the central Medina it was empty 
It was only a few houses there, and it was plantation of nakhal, of, of dark palm, uh, date palm trees, and so on. So he arrived in Quba, and when he, when he arrived in Quba, it is said that he stayed in a couple of houses for there's a different reports. One report says he stayed for four days, another report he stayed for 11 days. Okay, nevertheless, he arrived on Monday, and when he arrived, uh, he got offered by Kuthum ibn al Hidim and another narration by, uh, by Sa'ad ibn Khaythama, radiallahu anhuma. He got offered to stay in their house, and the Prophet uh, accepted. I mean, he accepted, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he stayed in both houses. Some of them, they said that he stayed during the day in the house of Sa'ad ibn Khaythama, who was a young man, not married. And during the night, he would stay at Kulthum ibn al-Hidim. And out of respect, because he was an elderly man, and out of respect for him, he didn't want to upset him. So he stayed in the night. Whereas during the day, when he wouldn't know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, guests would come and visit him and ask him questions, he would go to a single house, to a house where there was a single, there was no one around, so that the Prophet Sallallahu would accept guests. That is why he did. There's two reports. One report said he stayed in that house, the other report said he stayed in that house. How to combine these? As we mentioned, like uh, Ibn Ishaq mentioned that perhaps he stayed on both houses during the stay in Quba. The first thing that the Prophet thought of when he arrived in Quba on Monday and Tuesday, the first thing he thought of was to build a masjid. Because the Prophet Asim, he left Mecca, khalas, now he's in, stay, in a safe state, in a safe and a stable uh, situation now in Medina. So what happened was he said to the companion, let's build a masjid. And the first ever built masjid in Islam was Quba, Masjid Quba. Masjid Quba, and it is the masjid that we know of now, those who have traveled and visited Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu built Masjid Quba. He started building, but he never completed himself. So he either stayed there for four days until Friday. The first khutbah ever done was that Friday. Friday of Masjid Quba there. Uh, by the Prophet Sallallahu Of course, we said before, uh, Musa ibn Umair well, did deliver for a few months when the Prophet Sallallahu sent him for three, four months only. Um, so, um, but the Prophet Sallallahu delivered his first khutbah in Masjid Quba, and it is recorded in uh, Sunan Bayhaqi. Uh, you've got to go back to uh, the, uh, the sources and the, the book of uh, Hadith, where the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned a very short khutbah. Khutbah was probably not, not longer than five minutes, alayhi salatu, Wassalam. So he said, uh, he stayed there, he built, and uh, after that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after Jumu'ah, whether it is the first or second Jumu'ah, we don't know. There's different narration, different report. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Allah commanded me, Allah commanded me to build my masjid. And then he went on, a, on his uh, camel, what has uh, she camel's name? The Prophet had a she camel. What was her name? What was its name? Al Qaswa. Al Qaswa. Remember this name, Al Qaswa. Served the Prophet Asalam, yani truly. And sometime when revelation we come to the Prophet Asalam, Qaswa would feel it and he would crumble down. She would feel it and she or it would feel it and it would crumble down because of the heaviness of the revelation. Al Qaswa. The generation where Sahaba they used to, yani, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to race uh, Al Qaswa, yani, he used to make Qaswa race with other camels, and for a long time Qaswa beat used to you know go ahead, until one day, yani, other younger camels beat Al Qaswa, and then the Sahaba they were, they said but Al Qaswa then camel of Rasulullah been beat by other camels, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this is how life is. You know, you reach a high level and then you, you would grow older. Eventually, you will not stay there forever. تلك الدار الآخرة نجعلها للذين لا يريدون علوا في الأرض ولا فسادا. He mentioned this ayah. And then he went there and the Sahaba, Asad ibn Zurara, wanted to take the reign of Al-Qaswa. The Prophet said, leave it alone because it is ma'mura. It's been commanded by Allah. Scholars, they say perhaps an angel came to it and told the, uh, the angel told the Qaswa where to go. And he would go, he would walk until finally the Qaswa uh, set itself down 
and this is where the Professor Lassam said, this is where I should build the masjid. And he asked, he said, whose house or whose land does it belong to? And the Sahaba, they said that it is Sahel and Suhail. It is Sahel and Suhail. And uh, that inherited were both orphans and they were young men, still young men in their teenage, teenage, uh, teenage. And, uh, yeah, and it is theirs. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, let me ask for their permission. He didn't build just like that. And say, Sahel or Suhail, can I buy the land off you? And they were like, Ya Rasulullah, you will never buy off us. We will give you as a gift. Prophet Asim, he insisted. He said, no. So this is a good lesson for us. Although our Prophet Asim, he went through hardship and he deserved yeah, and he, what, he, what he was offered, but he didn't want that. He wanted to teach his ummah, you've got to rely on your own thing. Rely on Allah and be Iz, be Aziz. Try to be confident, be, have that honor and dignity. Don't rely on people. Don't rely on benefit. Don't rely on this. You've got to be, alhamdulillah, Allah gave you this strength. You've got to work. You've got to, you know, rely on Allah Azza wa and the ability that Allah gave you, the strength that Allah gave you. This is the lesson. And by the way, all the Muhajirin, when they migrated, they left everything behind. And we'll talk about that today. Today, we'll talk about the brotherhood. And the Muhajirin, there were over 100. They were offered so many things. And the Prophet Asim told the Muhajirin, don't take any of what the Ansar offered you. Don't take any. Prophet Asim said, he told the Ansar, let them work for you and pay their income. So the Ansar, and they didn't work. They were bosses of the Muhajirin. Muhajirin, they worked. And then they got their income. And this is how gradually their uh, financial situation got better and better. So uh, the point is that the importance of working, the importance of hard working. Don't be somebody who's not active. You have to be very active. You have to be a member of a society. You have to be an active member of a society. Try to help with the best of your ability. And if you're going through struggle, don't just rely on benefit and sleep at home. And no, you've got to work hard. Ask around. I want to work. I want to do this. I want to. And Nabi Sassam, first day he arrived, he worked. Alayhi salatu was salam. He was a leader. He was the leader of the Muslim, but he worked, alayhi salatu was salam, to the point that the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, when he was building the masjid, let me carry. He said, no, I will not carry your wizard on al qiyamah. He was working, alayhi salatu was salam. This was our Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So they built the masjid, and the Prophet Asim was very happy, and he used to yani, kind of say those lines of poetry, Allahumma innahu la khayra illa khayra al-akhira, Allahumma ansuri al-ansara wal-muhajira, and the Sahaba used to say after him, because he was, a, you know, there's no harm to say those lines of poetry to encourage the Sahaba to work, and then some of the Sahaba, they used to say that it is, in a form of poetry, say that it is a shame and embarrassing that we see the Prophet Sallallahu work and we don't take any part of, you know, building the masjid. So they all came together, Muhajireen and Ansar, they came together, and at first, when the masjid was built, there was no roof. It was just four walls. And then there were three main doors. One from the south side, which is the, south, the, the side of Mecca, toward the side of Mecca. So let's say, yeah, the, let's say this is the masjid. Toward this side, there was a door there. And this is called Bab al Rahma, the door of mercy. And then toward the west side, so Mecca here, west side, that's that side. Towards that side, there was a door of Jibreel, Babu Jibreel. And this is where our Prophet Sallallahu would put himself there. Uh, so it is where uh, the Prophet um, there was that side, sorry, it was that side, my mistake. It was that side, that side, uh, door of Jibreel. And this is where our Prophet Sallallahu will build also a room for, because at first there was two rooms at first. At first there was two rooms because for his two wives. Who was his two wives now that he moved to Medina? First one was Aisha, but he didn't he just got engaged, or her father offered her offered him. But who was his actual wife after the death of Khadija? She took care of her his daughters, Sauda. Okay, Sauda, and she was an elderly lady. But the Prophet Sallam loved her khair, and she was very honourable lady. Prophet Asim wanted an honorable lady to uh, bring her daughters up, uh, his daughters up, sorry. And this is what he did. They got married until Aisha and Sauda, they both joined, and they had two houses. And then later on, Sauda, she knew when Aisha got you know, older and stronger and strength, because Prophet Asim, he, he, um, 
he consummated the, uh, the, his marriage at the age of nine, when Aisha was nine. Nine, then he was like a strong lady. As I said before, my grandmother, which is only 40, 60, 70 years ago, she got married at the age of 11. It's not something yani, uncommon. Before it was something very common. When she got stronger and everything, Sauda radiallahu anha said to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I give up my right to Aisha. I know you have so much love for Aisha, she's yours. That just take my night. I don't, you know, I know I'm an elderly lady. You know, you don't have to come to me to visit me. You just take my night. Uh, yeah, and he give it to uh, she, he, she gave her night to Aisha. So this was the masjid. And the, as for the east side, it was Babun Nisa. So Bab Jibreel, Bab Nisa, and Bab Ar-Rahma. So there was no roof. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he started praying there. And then during these first two years, during these first two years, it's important to remember um, some legislation that happened during the first two years of the Hijrah. Why first two years? Because in the second year in Ramadan, an important event happened. What's the important event? Battle of Badr. Second year, Battle of Badr. So he arrived in Rabi Awal. The first Ramadan, nothing going on. There was no fast. Fast wasn't legislated yet. Up to 16 months later, Battle of Badr. This is what we'll be talking about today. That, because Battle of Badr has to be studied on its own. This is how so important it has to be studied on its own. So well, let's talk about the first year. What happened in the first 16 months? Many things happened. First thing that happened is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was commanded to pray the five prayers when? What incident in his, uh, during his life? Isra wal Mi'raj. It happened when exactly? In Rajab, what year? Rajab year 11. Rajab year 11. Some scholars say year 10, some scholars say year 8. Ala kulli hal, the majority of scholars say the later, the better. Rajab year 11. Rajab year 12. Rajab year 13. So, so a year and a half he prayed in Mecca. A year and a half, two years, let's say to make it two years, he prayed in Mecca. How many rak'ah did he pray in Mecca and he commanded his companion to pray in Mecca? Two rak'ah. It was two rak'ah. Every salah two rak'ah apart from Maghrib. Maghrib three rak'ah. But when he moved to Medina, nice stable, nice safe, Prophet Asim said pray four rak'ahs for the two or for the three prayers. Dhuhr. Asr and Aisha. And by the way, these two rak'ahs, it's not fully abrogated, but it is still applicable for certain things, such as Hajj and Umrah, or when you go to uh, do Hajj, and such as traveling, okay? And such as some of the scholars, they say Salat al Khawf, the Salah of the fear, if generally the battle happened outside of the city. And outside of your, uh, you know, your, your city where you live. Generally, most of battle, you know, happen outside. So you can, you know, uh, shorten. So shortening generally happen when you have fear. When you have fear and everything, then you can shorten it. So as soon as you arrive in Medina, four rakahs. And also as soon as he arrived in Medina, the Nafal prayers were also uh, legislated. In Mecca, there was no Fajr. There was no witter. There was only fard. Because you know the Sahaba in Mecca, they never prayed outside. They always prayed hidden inside. Our Prophet Muhammad, he was the only one who prayed outside. The only one. Because he commanded, it is said that he commanded the companion not to pray outside. Don't create you know, chaos. Or don't create any more. Tamam? So that's the first thing that I wanted to remember. That thing legislated. The second thing that legislated was the adhan. So when the Salat Jama'ah became compulsory, Allah told them, pray in congregation. The Prophet وسلم, after a few months, he told the companion, okay, now, how do we let people know that the time of the Salah? And they all came with an idea. They all said this, they all said, you know, let's do tambourine, let's do this. The Prophet وسلم, at first he was like, let's do the ring, we ring the bell like the church do. At first it was like that, the first time, the first day, he commanded this. And then a companion by the name of Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abdi Rabbihi. He came on the next morning, Salat al-Fajr, after they finished Salat al-Fajr, said, Ya Rasulullah, I had a dream last night. 
and it was a true dream, wallahi. And he said, Prophet Asim got excited because he had a dream as well. And we know the Prophet Asim dream means something, it's a revelation. He said, what is your dream? He said, I heard that a man came to us and said that you should call the Salah like the Adhan that we know of. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the Prophet Asim, he did take a beer. He could see, he was very happy. He said, Allahu Akbar, I had the same dream. Umar ibn Khattab went and then he said, teach it to Bilal. When he taught Bilal, Bilal's Adhan al-Fajr, Adhan al-Dhuhr, he did the Adhan. And Umar ibn Khattab came and said, Ya Rasulullah, I had the same dream last night, but I wasn't sure, I didn't want to tell you. And then, alhamdulillah, the dream tawatarat, wa tawatat, many became widespread. It wasn't one or two. Many companions had the same dream. So this means this was a revelation from Allah. Adhan was legislated. And Adhan is compulsory for a group of people. I mean, if you live in a Muslim land, it's compulsory for a group of people to do Adhan. So if you have a masjid with a loudspeaker, that's fine. Now, if you live in here, compulsory for each masjid to do the Adhan. As for if you're alone at home, you don't have to do the Adhan. Adhan is not compulsory. It's only compulsory for masajid, compulsory for a group of people, if you're together in a group of people. As for at home, you don't have to do the Adhan. Iqama is enough. And if you want to find out more about the Adhan, we go back to the book of fiqh. The third thing that happened during the first year and a half, first two years, was, and this is very important, was the change of Qibla. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now, okay, I'll tell you now. The change of Qibla happened in, uh, happen in Sha'ban. The change of Qibla happened in Sha'ban the second year, one month before the Battle of Badr. One month before the Battle of Badr. Prophet Wasallam arrived at Rabi'ah, awwal. So he stayed for 14, 15 months in Medina. Right? 15 months in Medina, facing where? Facing north, Beit al Maqdis. This clear? Our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was commanded the companion from the time, from the time where Salah was compulsory to face Masjid al Aqsa. That was the first Qibla. However, he prayed facing Masjid al Qabla. Only 15 months. Does it make sense? How many years he prayed in Mecca? Two years, two and a half years. And how many years he prayed facing uh, Masjid al Maqdis, Beit al Maqdis in Medina? 15 months. So it should be, yani more than that, should be 24 and 15 months, should be 39 months. But he only faced Beit al Maqdis for 15 months. What about the first two years then? Where did he face? Hmm? How? Yes. He was facing Beit al-Maqdis, but facing the Kaaba. Basically, the Kaaba was in front of him, and Beit al-Maqdis was behind. He didn't give his back to the Kaaba. He has so much respect for the Kaaba, he didn't want to give his back to the Kaaba. He would always pray facing Beit al-Masjid. And his house, by the way, is actually facing Qibla toward Beit al-Maqdis, alayhi salatu wassalam. That is why in the book of history, you'll find that Prophet Sallallahu pay, uh, prayed facing Jerusalem only for 15 months. It doesn't make sense. Because the first 15 months in Medina, they all prayed facing Beit al-Maqdis. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had a double Qibla, if you can say that. He was facing because his heart was always toward Kaaba. He loved the Kaaba. And for 15 months, basically, this is the Kaaba. This is where he used to pray, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Medina, north, Kaaba, back, basically, you know, because in Medina, south of Medina is Mecca, but he prayed north of Medina. And his heart wasn't happy. His heart was always not comfortable. He always wanted to face uh, Kaaba to the point that as narrated in uh, Imam Ahmed that he said to Jibreel Ya Jibreel ask Allah for me perhaps he would listen to you ask Allah for me to change the you know the, the Qibla and Jibreel said I'm a slave like you I said I will not ask I will not dare ask Allah this and they said rather you ask Allah in your dua and the Prophet Asam would ask Allah and they would ask Allah to the point that he would put his head up when he asked Allah, he would ask Allah like this. 
He only asked Allah with the head up if he really was in dire need. And this is what Allah says. We saw you, O Muhammad وسلم, facing your face up there, asking us. Now face toward the Qibla, the Qibla in which you are pleased with, Ya Rasulullah. Allah Azza wa has so much love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He granted his request. And this happened, as we said, in Sha'ban in the second year, and then he commanded the companion. He prayed Salat al-Fajr toward Jerusalem, Salat al-Dhuhr, he prayed toward Mecca. And when people came, they were like, oh, what's this? They all prayed toward Mecca, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them, a revelation was revealed to me. It was two pages. The first two pages uh, of just two. The first two pages of just two. Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed those beautiful and great ayahs confirming that the Prophet Sallallahu was allowed to turn. And it was a time for fitna. Munafiqeen, they were like, oh, look at this Prophet of Jews. The Jews, by the way. And the scholars, they say, why did the Prophet Sallallahu face Qibla? First 15 months, he paid Masjid al Maqdis. At first, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wasn't happy, but yet he accepted it. He accepted it. Because he knew that the Ahl al-Kitab were upon the Haqq. And he wanted, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, perhaps to gain their heart. What was it important for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to gain the heart of the Jews in Medina? Because the most powerful tribe in terms of money were the Jews. So he wanted to gain their heart, he wanted their guidance. But then when he realized after a few months they were so arrogant, they were so rebellious, and they disrespected him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had so much hatred for him. I said, you know what, we shouldn't be like them. I should face not the, the, toward the Jerusalem where they face, we should face differently. And Allah in those ayahs he mentioned, Ummatan wasata. He used the word wasata. Majority of brothers say, which is correct, they translate as the middle, the balanced ummah. But the word wasata means distinguished ummah. We are distinguished from other ummah. We are the best of the ummah. We should have our own civilization. We should have our own qibla, our own religion, our own, because we are the best of the ummah. The word wasata means distinguished, means the best. Imam. So the Prophet Sallallahu the scholar, this uh, book of uh, Lakim Nuis have mentioned that the reason why he wanted to face Masjid al uh, uh, Kaaba was because of the dispute he had with the Jews. That was one of the reasons. Wallahu a'la wa a'lam. And as we said, you know, the, Christ, uh, the, the Kuffar and the Munafiqun, they were making fun of him. In Mecca, they were like, oh, look now, yani, he faced. Jerusalem and now he's faking, facing Kaaba. What kind of a joke that is? And it was, a, it was a test for the believers. It was a test to the point that some of the new believers, they started to doubt say, what's going on to our Salah. What about the Sahaba who died? They prayed in Jerusalem. What happened to their Salah? And this is where Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ Allah will not uh, let your Iman go to waste. Allah, how did he mention Salah? Allah will not let your Iman go to waste. Allah calls Salah Iman. And that is why the majority of the Hanabila, majority of the Hanabila, they say, whoever abandoned the Salah, don't pray, they kafir, not Muslim. Nothing to do with Islam, out of Islam. Because it's the only relation between you and Allah. The only way you talk to Allah is through Salah. The only way you show submission to Allah in sujood, ruku' is through salah. What is Islam? To submit yourself, to show submission. How can you say, I am a Muslim, and then you don't show any submission? That's not it. It's like you're saying, I'm a doctor. Would you just believe me being a, saying to you, I'm a doctor? No, you have to you know, show that you study, that you're qualified to be a doctor. Likewise, if you want to be qualified to be a Muslim, you have to show submission to Allah. And the first thing that you show submission after saying the shahada is to pray. And, uh, naam, and then the alhamdulillah Allah Azza wa Jal, he reaffirmed the heart of the believers. And this is the first thing, by the way, this issue of changing is the first naskh in Islam. 
It is said it was the first. Nasr and some of the scholars they say, no, there was some Nasr. Nasr is abrogation. I mean, sometimes some of the verses in the Quran abrogate each other. Abrogate means make a new law. You have an old law, old law being changed with a new law. This is abrogation. And at first it was very difficult for the believers. How come is it possible that Allah changed his mind? This is how they say. It's possible that Allah changed his decision? No, Allah, as they were, when he changed decision, it's because of what's best for us. So gradually, gradually he would do things. Uh, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would first command to do this and that and that so that we can worship Allah in a gradual process. Amen? So this is the uh, third thing that uh, happened during the first year and a half when it comes to the new laws. So the first one is from two rak'ahs to four rak'ahs. The second one is the adhan. The third one is Qibla. And in Sha'ban, in Sha'ban, second year or in Shawwal, there's different. Either Sha'ban or Shawwal. Uh, can't remember. Either Sha'ban or Shawwal. Either one month after Badr or one month before Badr. Two other things was also legislated. That is Zakat and that is fast. Zakan and Fah, they were both legislated at the same year. Allah Azza wa Jalla saw the companion to be strong in Iman. Khalas, now they accept everything. They're in stable land. They are stable, they are safe. They can do whatever Allah Azza wa Jalla uh, request them to do. Tamam? So Allah Azza wa Jalla legislated this. We'll mention about that perhaps next week or the next week inshallah. Uh, because I did not bring that here. But um, Allah Azza wa legislated zakah and fast in the second year. Either one month before Badr or one month after Badr. Either one year before month, uh, one month before Badr or one month after Badr. Shawwal or Sha'ban of the second year. Okay, now we go to the second year. First year is after Hijrah. Is this clear? Because I, before I used to say year 13. And now you say year one? It doesn't make sense. Year 13 after prophethood. Now, when you say year one, year one after Hijrah. So there's no year zero. Basically, year one in Hijrah is from the year where the Prophet made that Hijrah. Okay, so he arrived, he didn't arrive in Muharram, he arrived in Rabi Awal. So he arrived two months, year one. Two months, three months, year one. Is this clear? Year two, which is a year 15, 16 months later, this is where you have Badr. Tamam? Now, during that year, what happened? A lot of Muhajireen started to come down, migrate. They heard Rasulullah is safe in Medina. They say, Khalas, it's our time not to go. It's safe. Medina is safe. And the Prophet asked them what he did when a lot of Muhajireen came. He did Mu'akha. He applied the brotherhood, the ties of brotherhood, the ties of kinship. He would uh, basically uh, appoint two companions, one from Muhajireen and one from Ansar. Let's repeat, Muhajir mean a migrant. From where to where? Mecca to Medina. So every time you hear Muhajir, the Sahaba who embrace Islam in Mecca. And they did Hijrah, and the Hijrah, by the way, lasted until Fathu Mecca. Even the last companion who did hijrah to Medina three, four months before Fath Makkah is considered as Muhajir. Our Muhajir. Who is that? Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran, لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا. Allah mentioned that the Sahaba they're not different. The one who embraced and he did hijrah and uh, give charity before the conquest of Mecca are better than the one who embraced after the conquest of Mecca. Tamam? Like uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and his father, they all embraced after, uh, by the way, most of the Sahaba embraced after the conquest of Mecca. We will mention, we'll talk about that uh, later. Um, Naam. So the Prophet Sallallahu did the process of Mu'akha. He would put two companion brothers Muhajirin, when they first came with Rasulullah or before Rasulullah, because the Muhajirin, they went before Rasulullah. And then Rasulullah, when he knew most of the Muhajirin who could travel, they went, he said, I'm going now. And of course, those who stayed behind, they couldn't because they were stopped by their families. But there were over 100 companion men with their families, and some of them joined, you know, had their family join later. 
from the Muhajirin, a hundred men. And from those hundred men, Prophet ﷺ, he did Mu'akha 45 of the Muhajirin with 45 of the Ansar. 45 and 45. By the way, this process of Mu'akha happened already in Mecca. It already happened in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, he has himself a brother. He has himself a brother. But in Mecca, the way they did Mu'akha was Prophet ﷺ would pair, he would pair between a strong in Iman, financial, mental, to a weak one. The Prophet ﷺ, he did Mu'akha himself with somebody else, with his cousin. Who was his cousin? Young cousin. Ali ibn Abi Talib. Prophet ﷺ said, you are my brother. If you die, I take you in hell. Well, at first, you know, he didn't know, but this is what happened. They were like true brothers. Tamam? Meaning, if one of them died, they would inhabit. But the Prophet ﷺ, of course, was not allowed to inhabit. And he also did Mu'akha between Hamza, who was a strong man, he was a wealthy man, with his foster son. Who was his foster son? Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha, who was a slave, weak. And he was even in, physically, he was weak. And the Prophet ﷺ did that, Mu'akha. So, Mu'akha is not something new. It happened before. But when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, he wanted to emphasize the topic of Mu'akha to ensure that each of the Muhajireen is looked after. And the Prophet ﷺ did Mu'akha between a lot of companions, 45, 45, Ibn Ishaq, uh, in his book Sira, which is a famous book of uh, over 18 volumes, he mentioned that example, Prophet ﷺ did Mu'akha, he paired Abu Bakr with Kharija bin Zayd. And he paired Umar ibn Khattab with Itban ibn Malik. He paired Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah with Abu Talha. And he paired Abdul Rahman ibn Awf with Sa'd ibn Rabia. The story of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was so beautiful. He was the wealthiest merchant in Mecca. Not one of the wealthiest, the wealthiest. He left it all behind. He only brought a bag of date with him. Imagine you have your millions, you left behind your million. Only for the sake of Allah. He didn't care about it. He said, you know what, I'm a businessman. I will take it back. And the Prophet asked him, the way he paid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of the scholars like uh, Rahiq al Maktoum, he mentioned that the way he paid, he would pay in an intelligent way. He would pay with people that are more compatible with each other. Like Zaid, uh, Sa'd ibn al-Rabiya, he was one of the wealthiest merchants in Medina as well. He had his own souq. His souq was his. And... Um, Kharij ibn Zaid was a very old man, similar age to Abu Bakr, and also clever and intelligent and honored man. He would pair together. Abu Ubaidah, who was strong, he would pair with Abu Talha, who was strong as well. Likewise. Yeah, and Nabi Sallallahu would pair together so that they will be more compatible. And then Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he left it all behind. Shah ibn Rabi'i said, Ya Akhi, oh my brother, go and look at my four wives. Pick the prettiest of them to you. I'll divorce her, let her wait, uh, her idda, and then you can marry her. And then say, look at my wealth, look at what I own. They say, half of what I own is yours. Look at this mu'akha. This is the fruit of the mu'akha. The ansar, they're called ansar mean because they're truly supporters. They truly supported muhajirin and nabi sallam. They gave up their lives, they gave up their time, they gave up their family, they gave up their wealth for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those are the Ansar. But because Muhajireen embraced Islam before and went through a lot of tortures, they have better in terms of uh, virtues to the side of Allah. That is why in the Quran, Allah he always mentioned Muhajireen first. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلِينَ مِنَ ال Muhajireen. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ تمام؟ Allah in Surah Al-Hashr, he mentioned لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ And then وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارِ And then وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ And so on. Always Allah start with the Muhajireen. Because of the torture they went through, of the sacrifice, what they left behind. But nevertheless, this Ukhuwa, it is what is much needed in our day and age. Allahul Musta'an, we have a lot of, we have brotherhood in the kalam. You're my brother. 
put our name, brother Muhammad. But when he needs you, inshallah, let me find out. Yeah, let me find out. And then you'll never hear from him. Wallahi, mushkila hadha. These Sahaba, they would give up their lives their, for their brothers. Yeah, and we should be brothers in action, not brothers in just speech. If we hear somebody sick, we go and visit him. If we hear somebody needs our help, we should all collectively work together and help him with the best of our ability. This is brotherhood. If you see your Muslim brother in the wrong path, we should all try and make him stop. Say, what you're doing is wrong. Advise him. This is brotherhood. It's not tribal. It's not because, okay, you know what? We have the same business, I'll help him. Or because we are the same country, I'll help him. No. It doesn't matter. The Prophet said, Wallahi la fadla li arabiyin ala uh, ajami illa bi taqwa. There is no virtue of an Arab over a non Arab. Illa bi taqwa. Allah he elevated Bilal to be black of skin and he humiliated Abu Jahl to have, or Abu Lahab. He's coming from a very, very honored lineage. Allah humiliated him. He's in hellfire forever. And Bilal, he's the Mu'addin of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah elevated some of the slaves, they were slaves. Allah elevated them because of their love for Islam and humiliated some of the Arab because of their, you know, what they did for Islam. They didn't do anything for Islam. So lineage sometimes doesn't really mean anything. Allah Azza wa Jalla, the Prophet Aslam, Allah Azza wa Jalla say, Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum. The best among you are the one with taqwa. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us from the people of taqwa. And then also this mu'akha did not stop in the first two years, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasized the first two years, it would emphasize to do mu'akha so that the muhajirin won't feel left out, won't feel like oh, I'm coming and there's nothing for me now. Now, khalas, I know, you know, I'm, I'm doomed to death now. No, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to take that initiative to say, don't worry, you know, you've been taken care of. And, and this mu'akha lasted until Fath. Once Fath, one Mecca was conquered, no more Mu'akha. Why? What happened in Mecca? Something stopped in Mecca when we Muslim conquered Mecca. Something stopped. La hijrata ba'd al fath There is no hijra after conquest of Mecca. Once Mecca was back to the Muslim land, it belonged to the Muslim, there is no need for hijra. So we think there's no hijra, I mean, there's no migration, there's no need for mu'akha. There's no need for mu'akha. And the delil of that is that Ja'far bin Abi Talib, the Prophet asked him when he arrived from, where was Ja'far bin Abi Talib? Hmm? It was in Habasha, right? For seven years. And he arrived in year six, end of year six, just after Khaybar. He arrived there, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, you are brother, I pair you with Mu'adh ibn Jabal. They paired together. So that pairing happened until very late, during the time of the, uh, I mean, during Medina period. And of course, the Ansar, as you mentioned, yani showed great generosity to our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned the story of Abd al-Rahman ibn Awf. By the way, we didn't finish the story of Abd al-Rahman ibn Awf. But he said, Dullani ala souq. So just show me a souq. Show me a market. I can buy. And, and he had that bag of date, didn't he? He had that bag of date. Slowly, slowly. He started working. After a few months, the Prophet ﷺ saw him in nice clothes and happy. And he was happy. And the Prophet said, what happened, Abd al-Rahman? Did you get married? And he said, yes, I did get married. He said, from who? From such and such. I said, did you do any walima? Did you invite people? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, I did that. And after a few months, he became, alhamdulillah, financially stable. And then after a few years, he was the wealthiest man of Medina. He didn't give up and say, khalas, is, my life is turned upside down. I'm going to go and rely on benefit. Or, There's no such thing. By the way, benefit existed at the time of Rasulullah, sallallahu We'll mention in a minute now, inshallah. Not the same way as now, but... <laughs> okay, now... This, uh, this is the benefit of Mu'akha, having the uh, brotherhood. Now, one of the ways of Mu'akha, and one of the ways that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi looked after the Muhajireen, with the help of the Ansar, was, you know, during the time when he changed the Qibla? You know, during the time when he changed the Qibla? So let's say, this is the Qibla. 
The Prophet Asim used to pray like this. So the front line used to be where? There. What? It used to be there, the front line. But then when Allah told him to chain the Qibla, the front line, chain would be here. The back line, the Prophet Asim said, make it a shelter. It's called Sufa. Sufa in Arabic is a shelter. Make a shelter with the palm branches and leave that shelter there for whoever come from the Muhajireen and they have no other shelter. Because after the first year, the Muhajireen came by one, two every week. It wasn't a lot, it was a few. One every month, two every month. It wasn't that much. But then second year started coming. People started coming. When they embraced Islam from outside of Mecca, they started coming. They come with nothing. They only come because they want to be close to Rasulullah So the back of the masjid, the Prophet Sallallahu commanded the companion, build a little shelter. And it's called As-Suffa. And this is a shelter for the poor people of Muhajireen. Because not every Muhajir can come and Prophet can pair with other people. It's difficult. Maybe other people, they're busy, they can't do it, they can't. So those who do not find, yeah, and the Prophet who did not find anyone to pair with, so he would say, stay in my masjid. They are at the back of the masjid. And they were very poor people. Some of them left a lot behind and they came to Medina to be the poorest of the poorest. To the point that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he mentioned, uh, Imam al-Bukhari, he mentioned, uh, naam, Imam al-Bukhari, he mentioned here that some of them would pray and we could see their buttocks when they do sajda. Because, you know, they have no other clothes. The wrap was half, you know, torn. And the Prophet would say to the women, all oh, women who pray behind men, make sure that you don't raise your head before the men. Let men raise their head and, you know, cover up, and then you can raise your head. This is how poor they were. They were so poor. And scholars of Islam, they wrote books mentioning about them, Ahlu Sufa. One of the books is Imam Al-Qurtubi. There's many books, yani, they mention. And in total, Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned that in total, in total, Ahlu Sufa, from the time of uh, when he built the Sufa until his death, until the Prophet asked him death, because after that, no. After that, that Sufa was removing Abu Bakr Siddiq. You know, Muslim were, you know, one went a bit like financially stable. There was no more Sufa. From his, from the time he was built until the Prophet asked him death, there were in total of 400 companions from Ahlul Sufa. Now, it doesn't mean there were 400 in the masjid. No, 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 no. It means that sometimes they would come, they would stay a couple of weeks, few days, until, you know, they find work, they find something, and then they would leave the masjid. But in total, people who passed through and they slept there, in total, 400. And some of the uh, uh, ulama, they wrote those 400 names. Radiallahu anhu, may Allah have mercy on those scholars. They wrote, this is how important for them, they say, Ahlul Sufa, they are the most important people. So they wrote the names. And then they wrote many names, and one of the names is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he stayed there for a few, a few weeks. And the one that stayed there, one of the longest, one of the longest, if not the longest, was the one who narrated the most the hadith of the Prophet stayed in the masjid for three years. And by the way, he wasn't poor. He wasn't poor. And his mom loved him so much. His, love, his mom, when she migrated to Medina, she said, oh, my son is there. Abu Huraira was a young man. He was in his 18, 19. He was a young man. And his mom said, he's my only son. I'm going to go to Medina. Now he's safe. I'm going to go to Medina. She arrived in Medina after Fatah. After Fatah Mecca, she arrived. And she bought a house. She owned a house. Abu Huraira said, I would go to my mom, non-Muslim, and leave Rasulullah. I said, no, no way. I would stay with Rasulullah. I would stay with Rasulullah. And then you know the story of Abu Huraira's mom, Abdurrahman bin Sakhar, when she converted to Islam. She said, my, my mom loves me. Ya Rasulullah, make dua for her. He left, when he made dua, he left the house crying. He said, I know Allah has accepted his dua. He went to his mom. His mom came out of the shower. Wait. He said, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Anyway, Abu Huraira stayed there until the death of Rasulullah. And then some of the tabi'een, they kind of say, but why do you narrate so many hadith? They say, what's wrong? Why do you narrate so many hadith? Yani, it doesn't make sense. Um, Abu Khattab Ali never narrated as much, as many hadith as possible. And he says, me, I was staying for three years at the back of the masjid. 
So when people were busy doing business, I was busy sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I was busy listening to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To the point that someday he would feel so hungry, he would roll on the floor. Just to try and, you know, distract them, himself from hunger. And one day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is a funny story, in a way it is a Muslim. One day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw Abu Huraira being very hungry, he was looking around. And he saw one day, he would walk with people, he would ask the Sahaba, what is the rule of this in Islam? Abu Huraira knew the rule. But he would walk him, walk him, all the way to the door, to the door of that companion. Why? Out of hope that the companion said, Tfaddal, come to the house, eat with me. Yani Abu Huraira, this is how poor he was. Yani that was before his mom came, of course. And then one day the Prophet saw that, he kind of laughed. He was like, Ya Abu Huraira, I got something for you, come to the house. And Prophet Abu Huraira was very happy. He said, Rasulullah inviting me, Allahu Akbar. And he went to the house, he said, Aisha, what do you have in the house? She said, we were just given a glass or jug of milk. Abu Huraira said, Alhamdulillah, today. Prophet Sallam said, let's go back to Sufa. Do you know these people, these 12 people, 30, 13, 14 people? I don't know, the hadith mentioned that there are a few people there. She said, I want you to give the milk. Abu Huraira kind of sighs. Okay, they will all drink it and there will be nothing left for me. In the hadith said that he kind of sighed and gave up hope. And then he said, everyone, and she, uh, Prophet Salaam told Abu Huraira, tell them to, to drink until the very last drop. And it was just a jug, it was a jug. And there were a dozen of people. They all drank. And Abu Huraira was shocked, it was like, it came to me, I could still see it was full. And then he gave it to Rasulullah. Rasulullah Salaam started laughing. You know, you drink yourself. He drank, drank. And then he said, drink again. He drank again. He said, now are you really full? Drink again. Prophet Sam kind of said, because he knew, he saw he was very hungry. And then he said, when I drink, and the Prophet Sam drink, we still have left, milk left. So the story shows that Abu Huraira was very poor. Radiallahu anh. He was very poor. But what elevated him in our ummah was his love for the sunnah. He could have left Sufa and do his business. By the way, he didn't stay poor all his life because uh, Uthman ibn Affan he appointed him to be a uh, governor in Bahrain. Bahrain was in uh, our Bahrain, our actual Bahrain. And uh, he was governor there. He wasn't like, uh, he was a governor, he was a teacher, judge and governor. Anhu. So he didn't stay poor all his life. But this Sufa, what's nice about this story of Ahl Sufa was basically the Mu'akhat the Prophet Sallallahu he first sheltered, there was some type of social help there. And then one day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the companion, just put a arish, meaning a type of table, and leave everything you want to leave, food, whatever, for Ahl Sufa. And that table was there, and this is how Ahl Sufa, Alhamdulillah, as I said, it's not 400 all in one go. Sometimes you have 20, sometimes up to 70. Bin Taymiyyah said there was one point, up to 70 people there. And sometimes people would come from far, they were not poor, they would just come to Talab al Ain for three weeks, like Malik ibn al Huwairi. would come from Najd and he would just come and sleep at the back of the masjid just to hear Rasulullah's Quran. And sometimes the Prophet would tell some of the companions who were more knowledgeable, say, You teach the newcomer, you teach him. He would appoint people, say, Teach so and so, teach hadith, teach this, teach that, and so on. So this al Sufa was the first social shelter, the first madrasa, was also a madrasa, because the Prophet appointed teachers, say obey, teach the Quran to so and so. And he would say to al Sufa, do not take the Quran except from the four, from obey, from, he would tell Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, teach so and so. It was first madrasa, first social shelter. al Sufa, the people of the Sufa. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as soon as he came to Medina, he did not say, Alhamdulillah, now I'm safe. It's time for me to sleep. He didn't do that, alayhi salatu wassalam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah said, and we have sent you, O Muhammad, as mankind, as uh, mercy to mankind. This is what he did. This is what he did. And by the way, things happened between him and the Jews. The Prophet Sallallahu made a first covenant with the Jews. And first covenant, he made a covenant. He made like a, a type of... A, of a paper said Khalas Medina is now like a new country, a new constitution. And he made deal with the Jews, he made an article with them. 
saying that you know we, we should help us if we've been attacked and we should help you if you've been attacked and so on why am i mentioning that because later on you will find out that the jews like in their nature and it's not surprising that you know they betrayed the rasulullah now they betrayed their own prophet they betrayed Suleiman. they betrayed dawood it's not new they killed prophet and messengers they betrayed our prophet muhammad sallam and this is why the prophet sallam ajlahum ajlahum mean uh, he expelled them. I will mention all that, inshallah, uh, in due time. So this is the first year and a half in Medina. And you can see that the Prophet asked him, as a leader, he did not you know, step back and say, it's time for me to relax. Rather, he worked hard for the Ummah to be united. He worked hard for the Ummah to be prepared. He also prepared them, as you will mention uh, next week, he prepared them for the battle. He said, now Allah told me, Udina lilladheena, uh, Allah says that now you are permitted to fight back because you were oppressed, because you were persecuted. You want to have your wealth back and your, 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 your property back from Mecca. So he said, now you can fight back. And this is when the Prophet asked him, he prepared the companion for that. And we'll mention next week how the first battle happened because of the caravan that went through Sham, that went through uh, Medina or outside of Medina going to Sham, going to uh, Syria at the moment. And then on the way back when they heard that uh, uh, Khalid bin Walid uh, or Abu Sufyan had a big caravan and uh, he wanted to stop them. And then something happened and this is what led to the first major battle in Islam, the battle between the Haqq and the battle, the battle between the oppressed and the oppressor, the battle between the just and the unjust, the battle between the Muslim and the uh, idol worshippers. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal that he gives this ummah the unity that we once had and he gives this ummah the strength that we once had and he restores subhanahu wa ta'ala the strength back to this ummah because when we Muslim were living for centuries, Wallahi, the whole world were in peace. The whole world were in justice. There was no oppression. There was no fear. The Muslim, the non-Muslim, they were happy under the Muslim empire. But this, they don't want to, you to know that. They want you to know that the Muslim empire, Islamic empire, mean lapidation, mean killing, mean beheading, mean this. But they forgot about the most important aspect, which is justice, which is rahmah, which is you know, mercy which is social benefit, which is social justice. Even the leader, they could not get away when it comes to Islamic yani, laws. As Allah Azza wa Jalla If you have any question, inshallah, I'll be all ears. Otherwise, I'll let you go, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Jack of